diminish the force of those propositions, but has strengthened them. Now I should add ASEAN to those countries that are not obsessed by fear of China. The collapse of the Soviet Union has redefined the meaning of power blocks. Economic change in the People's Republic has been paralleled by economic and political change on Taiwan. These changes cannot but affect their mutual relations. It remains true, however, that the People's Republic will never renounce one China. And the nations, including Australia and the United States, which have solemnly accepted one China, cannot unilaterally abandon our commitment except the price of an immense and interminable conflict. It must not be allowed to happen. I emphasise this concept of binding agreements because the history of China, particularly in the half century since the revolution, attests the importance China attaches to them. Hong Kong is the outstanding example. Britain's 99-year lease, which expired in June this year, was the symbol of the West's humiliation of the Qing Empire in the 19th century. At any time after 1949, China had the power to abrogate the lease. China chose instead to honour it to the end and to the letter. Britain chose not to do so. The so-called pattern reforms constituted a breach of the Dung Thatcher Accords of 1982. China's good faith will not be measured against Britain's 11th hour conversion to democracy in Hong Kong, but against the one China, two systems policy for the next 30 years. The agreement accepted by Prime Minister Thatcher. I mention one other symbol associated with the return of Hong Kong to China. It was the most watched political event in the world since television. The enduring image from the ceremonies was the lowering of the Union Jack. One speculates with embarrassment on the impressions which will be received by millions of viewers around the world in the most watched event concerning Australia since television, if the host nation for the 2000 Olympic Games is represented by a flag dominated visually and symbolically by the Union Jack. <laughs> the success of the Sydney 2000 Olympics bid leads me to mention and deplore the manipulation of human rights issues by congressional lobbyists and lobbyist congresspersons in Washington. You will be aware, of course, that Margaret Dovey, who swam in the Empire Games in Sydney in 1938, <laughs> travelled extensively with me in support of the Sydney bid in 1993. It is a fact that if the African delegates to the International Olympic Committee had anticipated conduct of the kind now being by pursued by the Australian Government and House of Representatives, our efforts would have failed. By May 1992, it had become clear that Beijing was Sydney's most formidable rival. On a private tour of China for a fortnight in June, Margaret and I were able to see the colossal efforts in Beijing to construct accommodation and sporting facilities. We'd arri we had arrived in China 200 years to the month after George III's mission under Lord McCartney. Amazing, these anniversaries. <laughs> Westerners are no longer required to kowtow to the emperor, nor can they expect China to make obeisance to them. We then went with the Australian bid team to Lausanne for the 100th session of the I an International Olympic Committee. The IOC acted correctly in rejecting a call by a subcommittee of the United States House of Representatives Foreign Affairs Committee to vote against Beijing on the ground of China's human rights record. Many delegations wrongly concluded that Australia had engineered the call. On my return home, I was able to set the record straight. 
opening the Chinese Studies Association of Australia conference at Griffith University in Brisbane on the 5th of July, I said, more United Nations human rights conventions have been ratified by China than by the US. The US cannot ratify a convention without the advice and consent of the Senate. Rather than complain about the failures of the Chinese authorities, the US House of Representatives Foreign Affairs Committee should have complained about the failures of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. You know, in America, the uh, senators generally are too old to have foreign affairs. <laughs> they don't. In uh, Australia, of course, our senators are sometimes as old, but they're less mature. <laughs> the fact is that the US Congress has no standing in the promotion of human rights in China or any other country. Another effect is that the definition of civil and political rights is recent, regional, and variable. In the United States, like these gases. In the United States itself, civil rights and political equality for its black population, 13% of the whole, came about largely as a response to Cold War pressures. America's civil rights achievements of the late 1950s and the 1960s owed more to the bluster of Nikita Khrushchev than to the eloquence of Martin Luther King. I take, however, a more specific and significant example, the abolition of the death penalty. <coughs> On the 5th of December 1989, the UN General Assembly adopted a second optional protocol the 1966 International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, aiming at the abolition of the death penalty. In a recorded vote, 59 members, including Australia, voted in favour, 26 voted against, and 48 abstained. The United States was the only country in the Americas which voted against. Between the meridians with the Travis Afghanistan and the United States, the only other countries that voted to continue the death penalty were Bangladesh, China, Indonesia, Japan, Maldives, and Pakistan. Malaysia was absent when the vote was taken, but later advised the Secretariat that it had intended to vote to continue the death penalty. On the 20th of October 1990, the Hawke government acceded to the protocol. We may safely conclude that, had the US Supreme Court continued to uphold its earlier decision that the death penalty was unconstitutional because it contravened the prohibition on cruel or unusual punishment, its abolition would now be high on the US list of universal and irreducible human rights. The next page is uh, pretty heavy going, but uh, I want to get them on the record. <coughs> The selective approach to human rights produces confusing signals from the US administration and Congress about two of Australia's most important neighbours, China with the largest and Indonesia with the fourth largest populations in the world. Let me examine one instance which occurred in April this year. As background, the UN Commission on Human Rights has considered the situation of human rights in China and in East Timor several times since protesters were killed in Beijing on the 4th of June 1989 and in Dili on the 12th of November 1991. <coughs> the Commission consists of 53 members, 53 from African states, 12 from Asian states, 5 from Eastern European states, 11 from Latin American and Caribbean states, and 10 from Western European and other states, we on. The G st stands for group. The United States has always been a member of the Commission and Australia served a fourth term on the Commission from 1991 to 1996. Resolutions coming before the Commission, which operates under the rules of the UN Economic and Social Council, can be sponsored not only by states which are members of the Commission, but also by states which attend the session of the Commission as observers. 
In April 1996, when the resolution on China came before the Commission for the Sixth Farm, it was sponsored by 23 states, namely all 10 members from WEOG, Australia, Austria, Canada, Denmark, France, Germany, Italy, Netherlands, UK and US, 14 observers from WEOG and one observer from the Eastern European states. The Commission, however, carried a no-action motion. On the 10th of April 1997, a resolution on China again came before the Commission. The number of sponsors had dropped to 15 from 23, namely six members from WEOG, Austria, Denmark, Ireland, Netherlands, UK and US, and nine observers from WEOG, but not Australia. Conspicuously, the resolution was not supported by the other four WEOG states, which were still members of the Commission, Canada, France, Germany and Italy. A no-action motion was carried by 27 votes to 17, nine members abstaining. The only Asian state which voted against the no-action motion was Japan. <coughs> the Philippines and ROK, South Korea, abstained. The other nine Asian states voted for the no-action motion. Later on the same day, a resolution on East Timor came before the Commission and gained the support of 20 of its 53 members. In previous years, the Commission had also passed a no-action motion on East Timor. This year, the resolution was sponsored by 22 states, 12 members of the Commission, Austria, Canada, Denmark, France, Germany, Ireland, Italy, Netherlands and UK, but not US, from WEOG, and Angola, Cabo Verde and Mozambique from Africa, and 10 observers from WEOG, the four other Nordics, two Dutch neighbours, Switzerland, Portugal, Spain and Greece, but not Australia. Since only 14 members of the Commission voted against it, the resolution was carried there were 18 members which abstained. The resolution was opposed by 10 of the 12 Asian members. Japan and ROK abstained. It will be noted that the USA sponsored the resolution on China but was the only member from WEOG which didn't support the resolution on East Timor. The different outcome of the two resolutions came about because the US informed Portugal that it would support Portugal in condemning Indonesia if Portugal continued to support the US in condemning China. In July 1996, Portugal and the six former colonies formed the Community of Lusophone Countries, CPLP. On the 10th of April 1997, Angola, Cabo Verde and Mozambique voted for no action on the China resolution and Brazil abstained while all four voted for the resolution on East Timor. Thus, conduct which the foreign editor of the Australian described as grotesque insouciance by Washington misfired. Portugal achieved its objective. The US failed to make the deal stick. The British are scarcely in a better position than the Americans to pontificate on human rights in Hong Kong and Tibet. When Australia's absentee head of state visited Pakistan and India this year to celebrate the 50th anniversary of their independence, the British could rightly and proudly claim that they had handed over fully-fledged legislative and judicial systems. In Hong Kong, the British encouraged the development of a brilliant economic enclave but they never pretended that they were developing an independent country. At a time when a film on Tibet is showing the influence of a Nazi on a new Dalai Lama, it is salutary to recall that in June 1904, Francis' young husband marched British troops from India to Lhasa and forced the Dalai Lama to sign an Anglo-Tibetan treaty. My conduct, however, is not so much with concern, however, is not so much with inconsistency or, as some might say, 
the hypocrisy. The problem for the West is not our selective principles, but our selective memories. Any claim for the synchronous e existence and universal application of most modern civil and political rights must skate over the realities of our record for much of the 20th century. We cannot impose our own amnesia on Africa and Asia. We cannot hope to have sensible relations with China until and unless we recognize that this proud and powerful people will never again submit to international humiliation. I reject, moreover, the deterministic views now gaining some currency in North Atlantic academic media and political circles that the Asia-Pacific region is about to become the ground for a clash of civilizations. A much sounder analysis of the region's future and Australia's role in it has been given by Professor Stephen Fitzgerald in his recent book, Is Australia an Asian Country? Dr. Fitzgerald accompanied me on that first visit to China in 1971, and I appointed him Australia's first ambassador to the People's Republic in April 1973. And uh, then, John, uh, uh, that was the occasion in which John Menadue accompanied me. He was, uh, we made space in our uh, trip for three uh, distinguished representatives of the media. Uh, John is the only surviving one, and he represented the Murdoch worldwide media. Well, Fitzgerald wrote in his book, the future will not be one in which the United States or any other power with which we Australians have shared cultural heritage or political philosophies or processes or institutions is the determining force in the part of the world in which we live. The dominant political force and cultural influence will be something like the coalition of East Asian states which emerged for ASEM, that is the ASEAN Europe meeting in March 1996, from which Australia was excluded. In turn, under the pervasive and dominant influence of China. Professor Fitzgerald warned, this will be an utterly new experience for Australia and there will be no certainty that we shall be able to handle it in a way which protects fundamental features of our society which make it attractive to us and to hundreds of thousands of people from the countries who seek to settle here. Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, I was the first Prime Minister of Australia to visit China. All four Prime Ministers who have succeeded me, Fraser, Hawke, Keating and Howard, two Liberal, two Labor, promptly visited China. There is no greater task ahead for Australians than to make a rational contribution to the strength and stability of our region. A key element in that task will be to use our influence, not least with the United States, to insist that relations with China are conducted on the basis of mutual respect and the mutual honouring of agreements, honourably and openly made open governments openly arrived at. You remember Woodrow Wilson's words. I believe that the agreement reached by our two countries 25 years ago and the manner in which both countries have developed our relations in the following years have equipped Australia well to play a constructive part in this great endeavour. I thank you. No, I don't. 
I believe China kept to the arrangement for Britain to have a 99-year lease. I believe it will keep to the 50 years agreement which it made with Britain, with Margaret Thatcher. As, as I understand it, and I no longer would claim to be an expert on these things, Australia, in accordance with that inherited uh, system from Britain, which has also been inherited by the United States and New Zealand and Ireland and Canada, we place very much emphasis on the written word, the written document, the contract. <coughs> As I understand it, the Chinese want to have relations with people whom they can trust and they believe such people will trust China. That is, they're less technical, but they're more trusted. If they have faith in the people with whom they're dealing, then they think that those people ought to have faith in China. And that... I would think is the difference. We are too pedantic on the letters. But the Chinese, with changes of government, they've kept the agreement. The agreements on Hong Kong were made under a very different sort of government uh, you know, 99 years earlier. 